Hello everyone, welcome at Box. Um, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, Moro. And I'm very pleased to uh, and I'm very pleased to present along with uh, Ganesh Srinivasan, who is uh, heading mobile at Uber. And uh, we're going to see how like, they are scaling like crazy. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll hear about Pierre-Yves uh, Rico, uh, another French guy, um, who will uh, tell us how they handle errors and crash uh, like on Android at Square. And so after that, we'll be happy to uh, continue the discussion uh, around like some drinks and food uh, here. So I'm Martin Lestagnol. I run uh, mobile engineering here at Box, and another team called Box Notes, who's uh, kind of like a like Google Doc to uh, take notes collaboratively. So tonight we'll, uh, we'll discuss how we transition our, our, our mobile strategy from um, a time where we were building a, a mobile app to uh, a stage where we are building mobile components for our mobile platform first. And I'll be, able to, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to share with you some uh, learnings and challenges we had along the way. So at Box, we're providing businesses with um, a way to share, uh, manage, and access your content securely on any device. And we're kind of like in the middle of like two huge waves. The first one being that like all the businesses in the world are moving to the cloud. And the second one is that like all businesses in the world are moving on mobile. And, uh, and so it's very, uh, it makes some very interesting challenges. It's very exciting to think how we can transform the way people uh, work and collaborate all around the world. We have 35 million users, um, 45,000 uh, paying customers, uh, including like 50% of the Fortune 500 uh, companies. Um, so 35 million yeah, customers, 45,000 customers, uh, 45,000 customers, 50% of Fortune 500. And so here's a, the same one. Uh, this is just a sample of our customers, but uh, you can see there's a like, pretty good variety with like uh, oil and gas companies like Chevron or global companies like General Electric, uh, Toyota, United Nations or Glaxo, Smith Klein. Um, and so, <clears throat> so two years ago, we uh, decided to rebuild entirely our mobile experience, and it took us like quite some time, we wanted to really focus on the user experience of our product. And it took us like a year and a half uh, to get to a state where we are very like happy of the response from our customers. We had like a, a good uh, experience to manage your uh, content on your mobile. Now, as we were talking with our customers, we realized that um, as we were going deeper and deeper in their use case, we realized that we couldn't continue to throw features and features in the product without cluttering the user interface. Basically, that's what you don't want to build. Um, and, and it's interesting because like, how can you solve this, this customer use case without ending up like this? And we believe the answer is by building multiple apps. So there's many different apps uh, we could develop uh, for ourselves, and like we started talking with our customers about like what are, what were the, the apps that we could build for them, and we quickly, quickly realized that uh, there was like some common theme across uh, different industries, but there was also a lot of um, specific use case for each vertical, and which makes it very challenging for us to address. Like, how can you address all these specific use cases? And the answer to that is pretty obvious. What's pretty obvious, it's like by relying on the platform. And we think the best way to help our customers is in fact to uh, foster a very active community of mobile developers. And 
We are very happy at Box because we have a, a, a vibrant ecosystem of, of 50,000 mobile developers. Um, oh my god, it doesn't speak. <laughs> Sorry, 50,000 developers. They make uh, each month 4.5 billion uh, API calls, and like, we have more than 1,600 apps integrated with Box currently in the different marketplaces. So, I'm going to start with him. Um, so, the role of the mobile team at Box is not to foster the engagement on our mobile app, but it's to foster the engagement on the whole mobile platform. And our mission is to make the user experience of Box awesome, whether it is in our own product or when you use Box in a third party app. And this shift from building one mobile app to uh, a world where we are building uh, an, app uh, an app ecosystem is bringing some very interesting challenges. For example, how do you expose uh, the existing work in different apps? We know that like, our different partners all kind of want to do the same thing with Box. They want to authenticate with a Box account, they want to preview a file, they want to share files, they want to uh, browse folders. Um, the other question is how do you maintain the quality uh, as you scale? When you have like, more and more developers using your product, you need to be very aware of like, the thing that can make the quality of your product suffer. The other thing is how do you ensure that you have a good ownership of the product you build? How do you make sure that like, it is clear that these responsibilities in, belong to one team or another? And finally, what are the best tools uh, we can provide to our developers? So, <clears throat> when we look at the Box app, we can see it as a set of components that play well with each other. Like, um, for example, you have the browse uh, component to, uh, to look at your uh, files and folders, the share, the share uh, to share your files, previewing your files, commenting, taking notes, and so on. And so we thought it would be very interesting for our, our third-party developers to have the capability to use these components in their own app. And so we started releasing some SDKs uh, in April this year um, at uh, BoxDev. So we started with the browse and the share SDK. And actually, we, are, we, we just released the preview SDK uh, yesterday, um, which is pretty awesome. It's, it allows you to preview uh, uh, more than 100 types of files. And, uh, and so what we want is that we want this SDK to offer the best experience for any app that manages in a way or another uh, files. And <clears throat> um, we, we, um, we wanted this SDK to be, able to be usable by uh, apps that are like, integrating with Box uh, account and for the Box users. But these SDKs are also uh, integrated with uh, the Box Developer Edition, which allow basically to uh, leverage Box as a backend storage, as a full stack, and so you can have a, an amazing experience without even uh, requiring your user to uh, have a Box account. So yeah, and you can see like like how many like we can we can uh, preview PowerPoint, we can preview audio files, uh, we can preview 3D objects, medical images, like. Um, Many, many types of files. So, <clears throat> while we were making this different SDK, we encountered a number of challenges, and uh, I wanted to share with you some uh, learnings uh, we had uh, uh, along the way. The first one is about coupling. So, in our SDK, uh, we needed a cache layer to uh, make the user experience faster. And when we saw that both the previous SDK and the browser SDK need these cache components, our initial thoughts were like that maybe they could share the same common logic. But the thing, the problem is when you do that, you have to be aware that you are tightly coupling these components together. And what it means is that you create deep integration between those components, often with very implicit interfaces and it makes it very hard to maintain. For example, um, who owns this part of the code that is uh, used by both components? 
Like, if one team is working on the previous SDK, another team working on the broad SDK, who's responsible ultimately of this piece of code? The other question is like, when you make a change in the broad SDK, how do you make, like, how do you know the impact it's going to have on the other uh, tightly integrated SDKs? It quickly becomes really hard, and the situation you, you end up being is this world where if you want to make a change in the component C, you need to know everything about component A and component B. And this is not scalable. Like, at some point, an engineer cannot load all the system in his brain. So that's where loose coupling is very interesting. Basically, it's, it's all about defining explicit contracts for each SDK. And when you do that, um, um, it, may, it makes it much easier because you can work on the component C, you make sure that it respects the contract, but you don't need to know anything about the other components. And so, it's, duplication of code is, all, is not always the worst enemy. Uh, it's true that as engineers, we love to automate things and we hate when there is repetition and, and in the code and everything. And I'm not saying that we should always duplicate code, but I'm just saying that like sometime, uh, when you choose not to duplicate the code, you introduce some other problem that you will have to deal with that may be of a much higher cost than the cost of duplication. <clears throat> and yeah, another thing to consider is how like uh, the code expressiveness versus the code readability. Uh, we tend as engineers to uh, wants to make a code in a small number of lines of code and everything. But the most important thing is not the number of lines of code you're going to make. The most important thing is that it's very readable because this code that you're making, you're going to have like uh, two years later some people who have no idea what this is about who's going to read it and you're going to have that multiple times and the cost it will take to actually understand a piece of code that is smart but complicated is much higher than like just using a like a, a little bit more line of code. The second learning is about cohesion. <coughs> so in the Bros SDK, we render uh, thumbnails for different file types. And for that, we, we have this private class who uh, just make, uh, uh, make it easy to render these uh, file types. And while we were working on the shell SDK, uh, we thought we needed the same piece of code. And that's, it's, that's very, uh, like, like you, could, you, you could want to uh, think that just by making this uh, class public, uh, you're going to solve your problem and you're going to be able to use it. But here, you have to ask your question, the question like, does a broad SDK role is to render previewing of thumbnails. Like, it doesn't sound to belong to the same components. And when you make it public, you basically increase the surface of the, the interface. You make it harder to maintain. You have to use like very very slim interface, and we really learned that from like our past uh, SDK, where like using a lot of like different uh, endpoints. It has to be very cohesive. Like if you look at these two pictures. Which interface do you think will be the most prone to bugs? Like, obviously, the, the one on the left. The third learning is about convention versus uh, over configuration. So, <coughs> when you build your mobile SDK, you always have the same goal at first. It's like, it's going to be the most simple uh, SDK, it's going to be beautiful, and like first time users are going to love it because it's going to be so simple. And so, um, often what you would see is like, uh, for example, to download a file, uh, you, you just give the file uh, ID and, and that's it, you can download the file. But then, uh, as you progress uh, in the implementation of your SDK, you, you think that Okay, but maybe there's some uh, advanced usage that we need where you can specify a different version ID or a different local pass or whatever. When you do that, what you don't realize is like, I mean, it's like, it's going to become incredibly uh, harder for the first time user to understand what this is about. Because 
the first time user, we need to understand all the configuration of each parameter that you pass here. So it's like optimized for advanced usage, but not anymore for simplicity. And so we had this problem uh, in the past with our SDKs, and we, we thought a lot about it for uh, this new generation of SDKs. And we came up with uh, a design that is providing a convention over configuration. So basically what it means is um, you have this download request, and by default you only need a file ID and maybe a local uh, pass uh, to where you want to store the file. And you create this request and you send it. And by default, it's going to use a set of uh, default behavior. So for example, we assume that you want to download the latest version. But if you want, you can change it. And here, in this world, like, you can override the convention with a specific configuration, but you can still use the SDK in a very, very simple fashion. Or you can provide like very advanced use case, like for example, this one is to create a shared link uh, where you define different permissions and like an expiration date and password and so on. Still very simple for the first time user. And we did that for uh, Android uh, and for iOS as well, uh, exactly the same behavior. And <clears throat> finally, the last uh, learning I wanted to share with you is uh, to dark through your SDK. And honestly, when I say that, I say that with a lot of pain of like the, the last years where we had to deal with it. Um, we used to have two different uh, SDKs on iOS, um, one developed by the platform team for third-party developers, and another one used internally for our own app. And what happened is, in fact, internally, we were not using the iOS SDK. And we realized that it was like very hard to, uh, to use uh, for uh, third-party developers. But we didn't realize that immediately because we didn't feel the pain ourselves. And so if you want to be serious about your mobile platform, you really have to be customer of your own SDKs. It's really like, so important. So uh, this is a lesson we learned. And like, now like, the, the SDKs that we're building are for both internal apps and for third-party developers. Um, so that's yeah, kind of like the last learning of the, that I wanted to share with you uh, tonight. And uh, so thank you very much. And I don't know like, if we have time for questions or if we go directly. Yeah? OK, cool. All right. Thanks. How do you um, identify uh, good candidates for abstraction or possibly um, interface creation so that you can create uh, a more a, a less interdependent uh, interface style? That's a very good, very, very good question, and it's been a, like there was a lot of debate internally about about that. Like, you need to uh, find a component that's going to have a very clean interface, very simple and that do not need to share a lot of like, uh, code with some other part of the... So for example, um, we, uh, we talked about um, having an SDK to uh, manage tasks. Um, and when I say manage tasks, it's manage like, operation, like downloading multiple files with a queue and everything. And when we realized the number of interconnections there was with all the parts of the system, we thought this is not a good candidate for an SDK. A good candidate is, for example, the previous ZK where you have like one endpoint, like you give a file ID and it renders the file. And, and that's basically the interface. The shared ZK is like you give a file ID and, you, and it shows like all the UI to share the file with all the different options. And so if you cannot express your SDK in very simple interface, it's probably not a good candidate for uh, an SDK. Um, this is completely off topic, but I'd really like to hear your opinion on when do you go HTML5 on mobile and when do you go native on mobile? Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, <laughs> there's so many different technologies right now. Like, I think like, the future is going to be a mix of both. I, I, I can talk about uh, the, the Box app. Uh, in the Box app, some of the things you see are actually uh, HTML and some others are native. And, there isn't a better one. Like it's just like uh, depending on your needs, you may have, uh, answer with one uh, technology or the other. Like we don't have any uh, kind of like preconceived notion for that. Uh, yes. So 
uh, talking about this case, what do you do recommend about providing beyond backend SDK to provide a UI SDK for each different devices or platform? Uh, what do you mean? So, like, like the Pivot SDK or the Shred SDK? What? Yes, what do you offer besides offering like a backend connection, like download files, uploading files, or oh, yeah, also yeah. providing UI components to represent those concepts? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, like this one, for example, the Pivot SDK that you just saw is a, a UI component, right? It's like it renders, it, it's a UI component that you drop in your app, you give a file ID and it renders the file. So it's like it's UI. The share uh, SDK gives you the ability to, uh, like, it gives you all the UI to uh, select the different employees, to access the directory of your employees, to share your files, to uh, set uh, permissions and so on. So you will provide, or you have two levels of in SDK, or it's just always UI, or you can interact, interact with, or provide your, your, your own your UI. So we have, like, you have an API wrapper SDK, which is backend only, and on top of that sits different UI components. Is it the this one? Sorry, that's another SDK. Yes. Oh. Yes. All right. Thanks. So we now like uh, talk about mobile development at Uber with uh, Ganesh. Thanks. Hello, um, I'm Ganesh. Uh, so today, um, it sort of uh, fit in very well with what uh, the talk just went in. This is a little bit about mobile uh, SDKs that Walk is doing. Uh, my talk is about like you know the challenges in scaling uh, mobile once you uh, you know you go beyond like five six engineers working on an app, uh, and what we have done at Uber. So you can sort of look at like how uh, even an app can be blown up into different small platform component pieces and how you scale. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, Something about me, um, I had uh, you know, mobile and front-end engineering at Uber. In the past, I was running mobile engineering at LinkedIn. Um, so currently, I uh, manage some of the platform teams of mobile and a few other uh, engineering teams at uh, Uber. So about Uber, uh, you know, just a brief two slides. I had to put something up. There was like, a lot of things about Box. So I thought I'd put two slides about Uber. Um, our mission, you know, obviously, get it from point A to point B. Um, the, 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 the challenge that comes in, and we'll sort of go through, is uh, we're close to 329 countries in the world, uh, six continents. Obviously, we can't do anything in the central continent. 70% um, of the US population uh, is, is actually covered. Um, we're trying to push the boundaries across transportation, like Uber Pool. Uh, it's, it's almost like 50% of our trips in San Francisco um, are all Uber Pool trips. Um, million drivers, uh, so we provided a million uh, job opportunities. Uh, the drivers also use a driver app, so the only way that anybody interfaces Uber, at least on a consumer from riders or drivers, is mobile. Um, so that's the only way that anybody can interface our stuff. Um, so that's a little bit about Uber, um, and let's get into the other stuff. So this is sort of a life cycle, like, you know, it's why is scaling mobile a challenge? So I sort of go through a simple stuff. It's like, you know, anybody, any startup that comes out, or any small company, you start off, um, is this sort of changing? It used to be that they'll always start off on iOS. Uh, nowadays, I see more startups coming up and they'll do something on Android. We typically start off in one platform. So, you know, that's what you can do. You have one engineer, you know, he picks whatever platform he likes, or you pick up something based on your product use case, and you start developing for it. Um, you know, hopefully you're lucky, things go well, uh, you know, you get instruction, and then we say, okay, let's start building, um, you know, across multiple platforms. Um, and there's not a lot of thought into really structuring the app or even the backend for that matter. In, you know, at this point, you're, you're doing your best in terms of building a product, getting something out in front of your customers, um, and making sure that you know, we have a good product. Right? Um, so the business logic at all is like you know, split up, it's in multiple places, you, know, you put it across the server and the client. And you know, typically, you have two to four engineers, maybe per platform, working on an app. Uh, most engineers would be able to, you know, know what is happening in the app. Like they can sort of maintain it in their head. Like you know, if I make a change, what is it going to affect? Uh, those kind of stuff. Like it, it still is manageable. Um, you, as it becomes more popular, you know, on the server side, you start thinking about like, okay, you know, should we create a proper structure? Like you know, have a front end, a middle drive layer, a back end that solves all these things. 
Unfortunately, on the mobile side of things, they still don't think that level. I think you know, we still are building features. You know, you ship one feature after another after another. Um, so it still remains the same. Four to six engineers. Uh, if you reach the stage, it's pretty good, right? Uh, and then crazy growth. Um, and I said many engineers uh, is, you know, LinkedIn, we had close to like 100 engineers working on mobile when I left. Like Uber right now has around 180 to 200 mobile engineers uh, working on mobile apps. And we split across platforms, there are around 80, 90 on each app. Um, and while this is happening, again, on the back end, you know, sorry, your front end, and you know, a lot of the companies are sort of adopting, you know, microservices or, or, or good modular patterns, uh, which helps them scale. Like Netflix has gone down that path, there are a few other companies that have gone. On. So you have, like, although your app's functionality or your product is growing, you have modular components, and you can sort of work through them. So, you know, there's at least some sort of method to the madness of how you solve it, how you go and scale. And the lot of companies here have done it. Um, so you can follow some patterns and uh, you're good. But on the mobile side, you know, it's not the number of engineers. Obviously, Google has tons of engineers and a lot of other companies. It's like the number of engineers working on a single app. Uh, and that sort of causes a lot of things. So let's look at like what are the challenges, right? Um, the first thing is like this comes up for any team that goes out like, like once you reach like 10, 15, 20 mobile engineers maybe is, is it a central mobile team? Or are we going to split it up? And you've seen every single pattern in the valley, like people split it up, they have a centralized team, then they go back to centralized team. Um, what are the sort of like, you know, pros and cons for that team structure? So we'll sort of go through that first. So let's look at team structure. Um, what do these teams give you? A centralized team, one team owning the app, like, you know, the, the, the best thing that comes out of the team is like the app ownership in terms of quality. Um, I think that's something which is, you cannot get without a central team because you know the centralized team always looks for the app quality overall experience, um, and I think so that's a big pro for it. You know, uh, when I say lack of product ownership, like you know, when, when your company is growing, there are a lot of features that are need to be implemented, and some could be growth related, some could be engagement related, some could be core feature set. You know, for Uber case, let's take a look at example where right? I mean that a rider growth uh, team deals with like you know signing up more riders. There's another team that deals with payment. There's like teams that deal with our core experience. Um, when you split up the teams, they start focusing on that single siloed area. And because that's where your goals are. Your goals are to make sure that if you're on the right team, I want to make sure that every single person that enters my funnel, you know, completes it. You're not looking at it holistically. So you start seeing like design issues, like you know, people will define like 20 kinds of button. I, each company is actually both at LinkedIn and what I've seen almost like 10, 15 shades of blue in the app that would exist because different teams come out and they've all added their own version of a small thing. Now, change that. So, you know, those things have start happening. Now, decentralized stuff for you is like, you know, if you split up the teams and say, hey, everybody, you're just on your feature and you just work on that. Um, obviously, they do a great job in nailing down that product, but app quality just starts uh, having a bad impact. and. Um, since you have the same app that you're shipping in and it's not like a, a separate piece of code or anything like that, um, you start having a problem. So what we have done at Uber, um, again, uh, I wouldn't say that this is the right or wrong strategy, but um, this is what is sort of working for us is we have a centralized platform team that um, sort of looks at the overall app quality and sort of looks at building all of the platform and components and the rest of the feature team sort of play into it. So there's a, it's sort of hybrid. There are mobile engineers everywhere in the company in every single product area. Uh, and then there's a centralized mobile team that is looking at beyond just build release and tooling and testing kind of stuff, focused on uh, building the software components and platform, like you know, build the platform so that people can develop on it. So that's sort of what we've got there. Um, development process, I think this is, um, I think beyond even six, seven engineers, like the branch uh, model of development, like at least uh, doesn't start, like you know, it stops scaling because you, every every feature resides on its own branch, and you know you have ten feature branches. If you want to talk code, you can't do it. There are no early integrations possible, so they just don't scale. Um, too many branches, you know. Uh, you have no idea about the when things are going to shift because uh, as soon as you start integrating them, you start having issues. Um, 
And this is a, this is an interesting challenge. Is like you know, if you ask an engineer or anybody else, like, you know, is your feature ready? They'll say yes because it's in the feature rank. But you know, by the time it comes into master, I think that's a long time. So uh, it doesn't give a good sense of where we are. Um, and yeah, dog fooding. You know, if you really want to dog food, and you have like so many feature versions, you know, your dog fooding gets limited by the small set team that you're working with. You just cannot have people have like 20 versions of app running in your team. So what have we done? Um, again, simple thing, uh, product development. Everybody works on master. Um, there is just one branch that we work off. Um, code checked in, build ship. Um, there is no, you know, unless you go into the guard or you found some issues, but uh, yeah, so the, the quality bar that we expect out of the code is much higher. Um, this is key because, as I said, when you're looking at like 50 engineers or like 100 engineers working on an app, Early integrations, although they are painful, is, is, is still much better than like, writing like codes for the like, weeks in your feature branch and then trying to merge it. I think it's just extremely hard. Um, talk about this. Uh, one thing that we do do with with front development is because your you know everything that's checked in is going to ship, is you, you need to have a way to feature flag. Um, uh, that is sort of a con of front development over a period of time because you start adding a lot of flags, so it's not necessarily like, like you're a big fan of it. Uh, but it's sort of a necessary rule. If, if everybody's developing on a single master code base, we need a way to be able to control it. Because your feature actually exists, it's sort of dark launch all the time, so we, we need a way to control it. And the, the, the side effect of that, uh, which is a good thing, is like I mean, you get to rank features in production, so you can slowly roll it out. The next stuff is the release process on development. Um, with this stuff is like, you know, in a lot of companies, I think until they start adopting, like you know, initially, the, the, we wait for certain sort of features to be done, and then we ship, right? And that's it's sort of ad hoc. It could be anywhere from like, you know, a month, two months, six weeks, eight weeks. Um, and what that does is, you know, the product managers just start getting anxious. If there are product managers here, like, Nothing wrong with that, but I think they start getting really, really sick. Hey, where is my feature? And what happens is if you start slipping the day, then they want more features then, which makes you slip even more. So you just are in this endless cycle that you know you can't get put out. And the problem is when you have so many engineers working on different feature teams, each one of the teams want to get something in. And they all are just fighting against each other. So nothing just comes out, right? So um, it sort of gets into a very bad situation. And then you know you could see in some Places that it would be like you know very ad hoc releases like it could take even two three months to release something out. And quality suffers because you know once you put a date, you know if you have to get it in and you know you will do whatever is needed uh, to ship. So what do we do? Um, train release. Um, so the key part about train uh, releases and train releases is literally what we say like you know, physical train. Right? But the Caltrain runs on its schedule. You know, Although sometimes it doesn't run on schedule, but it has its own schedule. We cannot change it. So there's the capturing schedule, so it comes in the train, runs on a specific time. Uh, you, as a passenger, or if you take a feature, you're either in or you're out. Nobody's going to stop for you. If you're ready, you're in. Or else you're out. So I think that's the metaphor for describing it. Uh, the key thing is remove development from release. Uh, trunk ships are a fixed cadence. Like, you know, the cadence is, is something that, you know, any company can decide what they want. At Uber, we ship every, uh, meaning, Every week we ship. So, like, uh, and the reason for that again is that if you miss it, you know you're going to be. It's not a big deal. Um, keep the cadence as small as possible. We picked a week. I, I think there are side effects for that, is because you know every week you're going to force upgrade your users, um, and that can be impact. And uh, in some places we may change it down the line. Like you know, if you're paying for data, there's an app that is upgrading every week. Um, maybe it doesn't make sense. Features are always dark launched, so you know this comes back to the, the last thing: front development and the paid release. Uh, you don't want to uh, have an issue once you go out. I think it helps you to turn things off if you want to. And the key part of the train schedule, like it's not train till the schedule cannot move. Like you know, there is no excuse like, hey, what, can we just move this a day? Like, can we just do it next week or not? Like I mean, this is almost like a machine. Like, you know, you cut a build. Uh, for us, I think we cut the build off on Wednesdays. Like you know, Wednesday at 12, the build is cut. And then we go through our uh, cycle, then it, 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 so it's going to go out. 
So, getting on to app architecture, like I want to, I just grew up like very simple, like this is like 25 minutes, I'm not discussing a lot of design details or anything up here. You know, you put up an MVC pattern, everybody wants to have some MVC or MVVM, whichever one we write. There's a theoretical box list and then what ends up is like now you, you want to start using location, you know, you start writing code, suddenly you see that it's being used from everywhere, okay. Models could, like view is not hitting it, at least it's good in my diagram, but you know, controllers, models, everything can sort of do it. And then you put in a whole bunch of other things. And at this point of time, you know, if somebody wants to make a feature change, it almost touches the entire app, right? So what happens is when you have so many people now, people lose track. If you make a small change in location, they, they do not know where all and what all features can get impacted, right? And if you have an extremely good regression, obviously it doesn't matter, but most companies when they are going through these scaling frames, we don't have very good test coverage. So this is makes it extremely hard because although you have so many engineers, you can't be productive because every change that you do has an impact that you don't understand. And the code has become so complex that nobody can hold it in their head. So I think this it is very important to break it up and do something, uh, you know, get a better architecture in place, right? Uh, so what we are trying to do uh, is to go towards a modular design. Uh, coming back to a little bit of what Martin was saying as well, um, modules perform a single tax. You know, same thing, simple the component and external SDK is the same thing, you perform a single task. Um, simple ab abstract interfaces. Uh, this is sort of even key for us, like you know, some of the modules, like for example, mapping for Uber is, we use Google Maps here, if you're in China, we use Baidu Maps. Uh, if you're in certain places, we will use Apple Maps. So we need that kind of flexibility for us to happen anyway. And that sort of goes for almost all of them. So provides probability is like extremely uh, important for us. Payment, map, storage, it's a good example for these, right? Um, loose coupling, you know, this is what we discussed earlier, so I don't have to go through this. Um, and uh, the dependency is interesting. So I think the, the, there, there are two ways to do dependencies in these modules. It's like you can have that every module understands the dependency with every other module and they sort of talk to each other or you, you push the configuration of the dependency up to the application. Uh, and the reason I say that is like Uber has multiple apps, like you know the two apps that people primarily see are the rider and uh, driver side, partner side app. We also have a lot of onboarding and small apps. Um, the way we do management is the, at the application level when the app bootstraps, we sort of say which modules and which versions to use instead of pushing it down into the modules to be dependent on each other. Uh, the last part is like in order to get to the modular design, like you know, anywhere you see, you know, obviously everybody wants to get there. Like, why would you not want to have like simple cleanup interfaces, right? Uh, but your code could be in a place that it's hard to do it. Uh, what the approach that we have done and it has worked very well for us is like, you know, create a sort of a facade in parts of the code that you want to abstract out. Um, so at least you can start setting up some areas and then, you know, slowly you can start uh, working on that piece of code and then sort of fix it. Uh, because, you know, changing all the app at one point is almost rewriting the app and that's hard. So, you know, hopefully we do all these things. I think the one other key piece, I, I felt like, you know, it's not necessarily architecture, but I think it's something missing uh, is that, you know, just analytics, just understanding what is happening. Uh, it helps in monitoring, debugging, troubleshooting. Also, it helps you, like, you know, are we building the right product, right? All that combination, uh, you really need it. So, what we have really done, in, like, instrument user behavior, uh, what does that really mean? You know, we want to capture what a user sees and what he does. Uh, very simple, right? And you know, you can figure out how to get the data that you want. Uh, but very simply, whatever he sees, whatever he does, we want to capture it. Because and that sort of uh, gives a very good idea of a whether they are engaging with the product and all the product metrics. But also from an engineering quality perspective, also you can learn a lot just based on those things. Network analytics, uh, we capture all uh, API traffic, um, detail breakdown. Um, this is, you know, even, um, some places, South Asia, India, China, um, you have the network uh, characteristics are extremely different. Uh, so no amount of testing that we do here locally can simulate that. You know, you, some of you might have read the Facebook uh, post that they did on this, and they've actually set up some test centers here, I think, in their Facebook app as well. It's extremely hard. But the good news is you can actually roll out and get this data from the user. Right? You can actually get how the networks are behaving everywhere else. So you need some analytics in place for, to do that. Uh, and then, you know, for mobile, you know, you need to look at hardware. I just put a battery in memory, but you have to look at a lot of things. 
uh, because you're using a lot of these sensors, uh, and if you do something wrong, um, you know, your app is going to suffer. <coughs> Hopefully, if we are able to do the modular design, which we have, you know, we gotten somewhere close to that at Uber, uh, it, but the ideal situation is if you build a feature, you can write your own feature, like uh, it, it's its own module, you know, and you work in that area, and you sort of, if you are making changes there, you affect your own changes. So I think, you know, um, the stability of the app overall improves, and you also have a better control of your business. So. So moving on, like tooling, um, CI, uh, for us, uh, you know, given all these changes and so many things that are coming in, continuous integration, for us, we use Jenkins, um, you know, had my heart some problem. Every check-in spins a build uh, and it's tested. Um, every check-in sometimes spins multiple builds as well. Uh, every single diff spins a build uh, and uh, the tests are on uh, before even the code reviews are, uh, are done. For that, uh, we use Path. Uh, what do you, I'm not sure what to what use, but um, we use Fab uh, and Fab's uh, review system differential and R. So every time you submit a div for reviews, um, we spin a build, we, we provide all the tooling so that it makes our life easier to uh, ensure quality. Um, and you know, we block check-ins for you know, if the build breaks, uh, you know, test fail, uh, check-ins are rejected. Um, and, you know, before they even land, and you know, sometimes. We we are still we're not reached a process yet where you know after landing a check in today we don't really uh, revert it um, there are problems around it but I think uh, somewhere down the line we'll get to it um, builds nightly builds uh, nightly builds not only do we create nightly builds we also try to force upgrade a certain um, set of people at Uber as a dog coding to be on the nightly releases automatically they just forced to use the uh, nightly app. So that also mentions, like, uh, maintains that like, the master trunk quality for us uh, is on a daily basis, not just like a weekly uh, ship cadence. And the last one is like all release process is automated for us. Testing. Um, so testing is this is like you know uh, the manual testing just does not scale because you know when you are so many it, it takes. Um, I think at LinkedIn, uh, from what I remember, it was like a three days to do a full regression, right? Um, so if you have a three-day regression and if somebody made a change, and now you have to do three more days, I think you can keep doing that forever, and you know it's, it, it never ends, right? So I think you know it's not that we don't need manual tests; it's just that with so many changes coming inside the app, unless we find a faster way to do the test, uh, we just cannot scale. So. Um, Uber, we do not have uh, any uh, manual QA organization, so I think you know from day one, I think we sort of focus more on tests and doctoring. Um, so regression coverage is extremely critical. So um, this is you write tests not because you haven't tested your feature. You write tests because somebody else cannot break your feature. So I think that's a mentality that people have to get in, uh, and that takes time because you know typically you, you write tests, you say, oh, I, I feel this is good. The question is, can somebody else break your feature? And you know, when so many people are coding in, it's guaranteed somebody's going to break the feature. So, you know, if you write tests, I think you're a little bit safer. Uh, what we've also done for this specific thing is also integrated with uh, with our build tool. That every single time a check-in is made, we look at the code coverage numbers, and if the coverage decreases, uh, we again warn or or sometimes may even reject your check-in because uh, the code coverage has gone down. In terms of testing, I think um, the we, we want to follow the sort of testing pyramid of sorts. Uh, if you say you want to write a lot of unit tests, some amount of functional tests, and very few integration tests. Um, the reason is, if, if, even when integration tests fail, we don't know why it failed, and you're looking at the entire app, all the code to really find out what happened, right? So I think you know we want to write a lot of unit tests, some amount of functional UI tests, and then very few integration. Uh, and that sort of comes to the subject because you know unit tests run fast. Test needs to be reliable. I think this is something which I've seen a lot of times is flaky tests are are even worse than tests because you know it just causes a lot of pain for developers because things keep failing on and off and you don't know what's going on and then people keep trying new things. Uh, so test needs to be reliable. It's key and then it needs to be fast. Um, 
you know, integration tests. Integration tests, uh, we have some, we've done a like, decent job, but we don't have a lot of things in it. Um, you know, Espresso for Android seems to be uh, the new one. Like, you know, we, we uh, have gone through like five or six uh, integration test frameworks in the last three, four years. So, right now, I think we're just sticking with Espresso for Android, I think, and uh, on iOS, we just do UI automation. Uh, but pick a framework that works for you, but I think writing some amount of tests is useful. <coughs> Architecting code for testability is, is also important. Like a lot of the times we can't write, if you can't write tests, that means the code is not structured well. So testing has to be like a, a first class citizen in the minds of developers when they write code. Um, and you know, this is something uh, that people have to think about. Simple clean interfaces obviously mean that your code becomes automatically testable. Uh, but this is something, if, you're, if you find that you can't write tests, it means most likely your code needs to be active. The last area is like, um, since we cannot test all possible combinations of how people are using it, like out here, out in India, out in China, or other places, having uh, a, a very detailed monitoring um, is really important because that's the best way for us to react to it. Um, so crashes, a simple thing, everybody tracks them, uh, but having real-time crashes track in-house uh, is, is extremely helpful. Um, user feedback, looking at app store ratings and reviews, Twitter, uh, any possible way. Uh, the more you can automate it and actually alert on it is also helpful. Uh, performance, uh, measuring performance in production and in CI, uh, looking at like FPS, like network latency, launch time, start time, seeing when changes go out, how they impact it, I think uh, is extremely helpful. Um, network, as I mentioned there. Um, and the last is automated alerting, right? Like you don't want, you know, it's, if it's a, just a dashboard and you're manually just seeing it, I, I don't think it's going to be useful. You need some amount of integration with whatever alerting system that your company uh, uses uh, to really get traced when things go wrong. Yeah, and hook it up to internal tools. This was, uh, this is actually a good learning. I mean, a lot of the times we use third party, some crash tracking tool, and they have their own alerting system. If it doesn't integrate with your, with your company's alerting, like, Page of duties or like equivalent alerts, uh, there are always been a lot of issues with it. So I think some way to integrate with the tools that your company uses is useful. That's pretty much it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how much time I have, but. Hi, uh, my name is Shams, and so you said we should try to avoid dependencies, dependency hell, right? <coughs> So, but when you try to expand into different geographical locations, there comes a lot of dependencies, right? So for example, you said some places you need to use Google Maps, some places you need to use Apple Maps for different kinds of payments, right? So, when you're trying to expand into different locations, how do you decide what to compromise on the technology side so that you can expand in a better way and still avoid those dependencies? Yeah, the, the dependency uh, was not necessarily like swapping of modules because, you know, if your interfaces are very clean and you know, and, and if the modules are working as they are, swapping like a mapping, like a Google mapping library to Baidu is actually very easy. At Baidu maps API is exactly the same as Google. They just copied it. So it's actually a very easy thing to do. Um, the problem when I say about like modules and, and dependency hell is like, you know, module A depends on module B, certain version. B depends on C. A also depends on C. So now you have these kind of combinations. That creates a lot of problems, right? In order to solve that, you know, it, it, the more modules you add, it, it's sort of a problem. You know, so you have to keep looking at it to see what's happening. A, go with building modules. If the interfaces are simple, if they don't change, you don't need to change the module version that much. Like you now, if you follow semantic versioning and you make sure your APIs are, are, you know, they don't change on every single check-in, but if you have to change your API, then it's not a module, right? So try to avoid that. And the dependency management itself, like if, if A depends on B, a specific version, do you want A to know about this thing or do you have a configuration done at the higher level? So the choice we have taken is we move the configuration of A version of, like version 1.0 of A depending on version 2.0 of B, sometimes to the application so you can configure it. So that's a better way for us to find. How do you guys decide whether a change has had a positive effect or a negative effect? And how do you decide whether to roll it back or not? Do you guys A-B test? Do you do some other framework to isolate the changes and see the effects on user behavior? 
Yeah, um, so we have an experimentation platform that we use, uh, which is internally built, uh, which gives us the ability to ramp and test. Uh, one of the things that I said in terms of the analytics is like, we treat almost every change, you know, because we want it to be flat. We want to flag it with the same experimentation framework. So in mobile, actually, that's a very important question is, any change that you think about, even the most innocuous ones, have actual user-facing impact, right? Um, and I've seen it a lot of times, like, you know, these are not like, it feels like a trivial, non-product oriented change, and suddenly your trip rate, cancellation rate went down because you caused a change. So we sort of try to look at it that way. Um, the issue that we face is when you have so many flags, nobody cleans it up. So uh, that's that's the problem that we see is people people there's a lot of flags and a lot of experiments, and they just never like you know. So you are you have too many branches in your code. Right. Yes. Um, how do you handle? Changes to the API uh, version, uh, backwards compatibility of API versions, and related question: JSON or Thrift or protocol buffers? Do you use it? Oh, from the yeah. So, uh, so from the client to server side uh, APIs, I, uh, we are moving towards a something like what you mentioned. Uh, so internally, our our work, most of the stuff we are doing on Thrift. Uh, externally, all of the stuff is on JSON. We do not have a script schema yet. We are moving towards it uh, and, and doing validation between them. Now, as far as versioning goes, I think we want to follow the versioning. But if you break the uh, API, like you know, if you're if you're making a breaking API chain, you need to bump up your version, right? And you know, if you're using Gradle or something like inside of these modules, if you're using Gradle or Ants for dependency, you can actually specify version ranges. You can say I'll pick up any version three dot two stuff, right? Or you can be very explicit. In the interest of time, we're going to take one more question. Ray? Yeah. Um, do you have a code coverage target, like 80%, 75%, or something like that? And also, uh, what is the ratio of the unit tests versus integration tests and functional tests? Yeah. Uh, the first one, uh, I personally don't like uh, numbers, like code coverage numbers. Uh, but what I found out is if I don't give numbers, people don't write tests. So we, it's, it's an arbitrary number. I just keep increasing it, so people write more tests. Uh, but the quality of tests uh, matter much more than the number. Uh, but then when you're having hundreds of engineers coding in, you just have to force a number which is higher. So we want to keep pushing the numbers higher and higher. That's uh, what we do. Uh, second question, I forgot what it was like. Why don't we talk afterwards, maybe? I think I'll be staying on. Thank you, guys. Thank you. OK. Uh, let me just get that all right. Hello, hello everyone. So um, I'm Pierre Rico. You can call me Py or Pierre. Uh, I won't ask anyone to pronounce my full name. It's really hard. Uh, I want to start with a, a quick poll. So, how many po people here are Android developers, or have done some Android development? Like, even if you still don't. Okay, I have a good chunk of the the room. Um, how many people have used uh, Square libraries? A few folks. Okay, cool. Um, so today, I'm not going to talk about any of the Square libraries, so not really. I'm, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to try to make crashes interesting, which it's hard. It's really hard, because who wants to deal with crashes, really? All right, so let's look at what a crash looks like. So on Android, this is what you get when the app crashes. A weird, disgusting uh, dialog that tells you, hey, this app has crashed, do you want to report it or not? Now, the question is, how many people have ever clicked the report button over there? Yeah, not even like, <laughs> I don't know, 10 people. And, and you are developers, like you probably do it more than most people. So, this report button right there, useless, nobody ever clicks it. Um, so when there's a crash in your app, uh, it's quite likely that through the Play Store, which is what this mechanism uses, you won't get any information about these crashes. Um, but then, what you'll get is one-star reviews. The app crashed on my device. Your app, you know, it's really bad, I hate it. Um, and that's bad, that's a bit sad. So, so we need to fix it, we need to improve the situation. So Android, I know not everybody does Android here, so I'm going to introduce some concepts. Uh, it's a Linux uh, 
system. And so every app is actually a Linux process. Every app is a virtual machine. And the question is, what is a crash on Android? So it's actually quite simple. Uh, somewhere on the thread, you uh, throw an exception, say an Easter exception. Um, what happens? It goes up the call stack until something catches it, and if nothing catches it, then it's delegated to something called the default exception handler, the thread default exception handler. And Android installs one by default. So uh, if you've done a little bit of Java, you know that every single app in the Java world starts with public stati static void main. Well, Android is not different. There's a class called runtime init, and that's where things start. And the first thing that's done when an Android app starts is setting a default uncode exception handler. And it's, this is not exactly the code, but that's basically what it does. What it does is when there's an exception, it just a log it to logcat, and then display the dialog that we show, and then just kill the Linux process, right? So that's great, but we don't have the information we want. However, um, Android being open source, it's really easy to see, go in there and see that you can change these things. So what you can do is um, replace, on the start of your app, replace this exception handler with something that's going to set the exception in the cloud up there, and, and then do the normal thing and, and crash and, and uh, kill the app. So I'm not going to talk about how to do that, actually. Uh, you can use a library for that. There's uh, Crashlytics and their magical big stamp, or Bugsnag, uh, I guess a smaller competitor, or even Acra, which is an open source library, uh, to use whatever you want. I wouldn't recommend writing your own, because why would you waste any effort doing that? Uh, I mean, unless you're trying to build Crashlytics next generation or something. Um, so. Another one that's interesting is native crashes, and that's a little bit different. Uh, so a native crash is basically a signal sent to, when I say native, I mean like in, um, in native code, in GNI, uh, C code. Um, it's basically a signal that's sent to a, a signal handler. What we do here is we use something called Google Breakpad, and that, let's say that it generates sort of a call stack or a, stack that represents the state of the native code, and it's something called a mini dump, so we just fake 64 and put that, and then we create a fake stack trace, and we just send that through Crashlytics or Bugsnag or whatever as a, as a fake stack trace. This is the, this is the sample, sample code you could use to do that, um, just because we didn't want to have another tool for like native crashes to report them. Um, okay, that's nice. Now, You've been, you know, you're using uh, Crashlytics, you get a crash, what do you do? Well, if you're a Java developer, you know that the first thing you do is you look at the stack trace, right? Um, so stack trace contains a, bunch, contains a bunch of information like the stacks, and uh, what's very interesting is the line numbers, obviously. You wanna, one trick that you need to remember, remember is when you go and look in, your, in the sources, look at the right version. Uh, I can tell you how many times I've been like looking at a stack trace, look at the line number, and then it's been, the code has changed since, and I'm like looking at the wrong line, and I'm gonna wait some time and not understand what's going on. So get the right version of your sources. Then if you look at this, you realize some stuff is missing here. So tools, and that includes Bugsnag and Crashlytics, they all try to, they think that, Bugs, uh, that um, stack traces are hard, and that you're dumb, and so they think that they can simplify the problem for you by hiding the interesting information, well, hiding what they think is not interesting. The problem is, it makes it really hard to understand where things are originating from. So always look at the full stack trace, it's much better. For example, a new pointer exception here. Um, that's great, and if you were doing Java server development, in many cases that's more than enough to fix, to fix a bug. Now on Android, and in mobile development in general, it's much harder. Why? Because on the server, you get a request, and you basically process a request as a bunch of stack frames, so when you get a crash somewhere, the stack, the stack frames represent all of the, the, the things that your request have been through, versus when you're on a client, it's a callback-oriented development. So all you get is a callback, and the callback doesn't represent anything, or doesn't tell you anything about what happened before, and what's the current state of the app. So we don't have a lot of info. And the problem, if we want to fix a crash, we need to be able to reproduce it. And, and to reproduce it, we need information. So fixing requires reproducing a crash. 
uh, this picture here is like one of those uh, crazy chain reaction machines, but you can imagine that usually when you get a crash, I mean, you're all smart, you don't introduce crashes on purpose, so when there's something like that, it's because there's a chain of elements and reactions that end up creating that crash, and it's really hard to understand, you know, why is this, is this null here, what happened before, and all of that, and so you need to, in your mind, reconstruct the whole world. So you need, we use a bunch of uh, different sources of information to do that. So one thing we do is what I call static information. So for example, uh, if, you, if you write a, an app that works both on tablets and, and mobile, then you probably know that the UI is going to be different and there's going to be some different code. If one crash happens only on tablets, it's important to note. So that's the kind of information that you want to know, which on Android translates to uh, the minimum weights of 600 dp, for example, that's what we use. Uh, the device details, the model, is very important. The OS version, these kind of things. Um, one, thing, one thing that's very interesting is why um, all of these libraries, uh, they let you set an ID on, uh, user ID on the crash. And that's very interesting because it lets you, uh, well, first of all, you could get in touch with them. You have a user, they get a crash, they're not telling you anything, but they hate you, and maybe it's important to contact them and say, hey, we're sorry about this crash, uh, here is five dollars to make up for it or something. But the second thing is you could get in touch with them to actually ask them more information because you didn't get enough information. So this is super useful. It's also been useful for us to identify that someone is getting all the crashes, and like it's just this guy. If there's a crash that's happening, I don't know, 6,000 times, but only for one guy, well, I'm sorry, but uh, we have more important things to do and buy a new device, maybe? Sorry. Um, so another thing that's important is uh, knowing the current state of the app. So you might not be able to see it from far ahead over there, but uh, say this is so a square. You know, a square register is an app to take payments, and so there is a signature screen where where you can uh, sign with your finger. And I try to make the box and square logo at the same time, and it looks terrible. But that's not the point. Uh, the point is, if we got a crash here. Um, it's interesting to know what the user was looking at, right? But we can't really upload a bitmap because that's a lot of, uh, that's, well, that would be a huge payload. So what we do instead is we just traverse the view hierarchy and we create a string representation of that and we upload that str string representation. So you can see like the sign view here, uh, which is this whole thing, and then for example here, there's um, the, the, the amount that's right here, or here there's the, like, the clear signature, signature button. And so that helps a lot in understanding where did it, where did it happen, and what, the, what was the user looking at, at, like the kind of the state of the app when the crash happened. The next thing that's even more useful is the um, history. The sort of a navigation log, or generally a log of what happens. And that has enabled me to solve so many crashes because you're looking at this, and there might be a little bit too much information. So here it's a mix of the screens that we're showing, the HTTP calls that we're making. That's very important because maybe an HTTP call is returning a 400, and maybe that causes a crash as a chain reaction. You won't see it in the stack trace, but knowing that you know maybe you got logged out right before the crash might help you understand how to fix the crash. This is super important, and uh, all of these libraries provide that. You absolutely need to use it. Um, it will help you a lot. Finally, there's one, so as we saw, stack traces are sort of useful. Stack traces in general are useful to quickly identify if it's a simple bug. And if it's, if it's not obvious, if you can tell, oh yeah, that's obvious, like I was stupid, then um, you should kind of look away from the stack trace. Um, there's one kind of crash that's even worse, and it's the uh, out of memory error exception. Um, out of memory errors crashes, where <clears throat> You're trying to do something like create a bitmap, and you get, I don't have any, any more memory from, uh, from Android. It tells you, like, I can't do it. Most people are going to think, oh, my bitmap was too big. But that's not true. If you have like 64 megs, you're trying to create a one meg bitmap. What did you do with the rest? Like, what happened? And that's the problem. And usually, when you get a stack trace, you, like an adult memory error, you shouldn't look at the stack trace. This is just the tip of the iceberg. You want to know where's the rest. And that's usually called by, caused by memory leaks. And I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but uh, um, I wrote a tool that's called Leak Canary. So you can just go to that URL and look it up, and it helps you detect and fix memory leaks. So 
that's all for uh, advertisement. I'm going to move on. All right. All right. Another. Um, I want to get to kind of the title of this talk, uh, which was crash fast. So let's say we're looking at a crash here where after signing, we finish the transaction and we can enter our email to send, uh, to get a receipt about the transaction, right? And so let's say that for some reason, uh, so there's UI validation. You need to make sure that the person doesn't enter an empty email because that doesn't make any sense. So let's say that for some reason the UI validation is broken and then the code goes through and tries to pass, it, pass in that empty string to the um, business logic. And you get a runtime exception blank email, something won't happen and um, you get a crash, right? You don't know why, you're like, what's going on? Um, so there was an exception, it means something unexpected happened, that's kind of a, why it's named exception. Um, yeah, <laughs> Captain Obvious here. Um, so, one way to solve that is sort of the shrug. Um, so, defensive programming, um, I don't expect, I expect to never get a blank email, but if I do, then I'm gonna just uh, do nothing, because who knows what's gonna happen after. And so, I, I mean, obviously, you can feel negative. I kind of want to ask who's done that before, but obviously no one's gonna say yes, because it uh, sounds bad. Right. Well, that's, that depends on what you're doing. If you're writing an API, for example, uh, you can't, you, you know, uh, we talked about that right before, and, and you can't expect how, like, what crazy things people are going to do with your APIs. You kind of go and try to handle all the cases. But here we are in control, we are in our own code, and if we can't figure out why this thing that should never be blank is actually blank, then it's bad, and if we don't report it, it's even worse. So instead of defensive programming, we do offensive programming, uh, also known as crash fast. Um, the idea being, anytime you think something is important, you assert it, you say, this should not be null, this should not be blank, and it means that the app is going to crash. And yes, we do it in production. In Square Register right now, we have a lot of those, and people get crashes, which sounds crazy, right? Well, think about this. Um, you're going to complain as hard as possible, as soon as possible, right? And so people are going to get crashes, but instead of trying to handle something that you don't understand, you're uh, crashing when it happens, which means you can, you can start walking backwards and, and finding where it happened, and maybe putting another condition saying, oh, we shouldn't be in that state there, etc., etc., etc. What that means is you're going to be able to detect problems early, um, there's also a side effect, a very interesting side effect for uh, like a large team, which is that the quality of the code increases. I can tell you how many times I've been in a team where uh, people are like, well, I don't know why this is null, uh, so I'm going to like, just check for null because I don't really understand what's going on in that code and I don't really want to know. Uh, I don't think that's called code quality, right? Code quality is when you understand what's going on, it's very clear, very readable, and so that helps. Yeah. It's not blank. It should never be blank. Okay, I understand. I don't expect it to be blank. I don't have to deal with that case. Um, and that's why it's the title of this talk. It's one of the... I understand it's not easy to grasp, and many people may disagree with it, but it helped us tremendously in reducing uh, our crash rate. When you start doing that, the crash rate will increase. But over time, it will de decrease because you fix the bugs, obviously. I mean, you have to fix the bugs, otherwise, no, it won't, it won't decrease. Uh, but once you start fixing those bugs that you detect early, the crash rate will decrease and you will also have no weird state. So Square is doing like payment things, right? You don't want payments to be in a weird state. You don't want to be like, oh, maybe there is a payment, maybe not, we don't know, it's unclear. Um, so so we, we're getting more and more crashes because of that. So how do we avoid like being, having the app crash too much? So number of steps which uh, were covered partially in the previous talk. First one is obviously integration tests, uh, having this sort of like uh, UI test, we use Expresso for that, that run for every pull request. And we parallelize all these uh, UI tests on, v on VMs, so it goes faster, it's about 20 minutes for us. We don't use real devices, uh, maybe someday, but the main problem with real devices is it's just harder to get something that is stable and consistent across the board, versus if you use a VM, it's a kind of always the same, so it works really well. And for us, a pull request takes about 20 minutes to build, for example, so you could say that's long, but it's also 
much faster than it used to be, and in, that includes uh, the UI tests. And then there's the next step, when you're about to release, you do smoke testing, uh, also known as, uh, known as manual QA. So um, that's to take with a grain of salt. It's, so, and that's, again, uh, related to the previous talk, it doesn't scale if you try to cover everything. For us, what's really important is we're building an app where you can take payments. And you can do a whole lot of things as well. But you can take payments, and that's the mission of our company. So that's where we do annual QA. Even if we have UI tests, even if we test everything, we never ship something that hasn't been tested by a real human, because this has to work. There's no way this doesn't work. We can't do a release where this doesn't work. Um, and we do it internally. We have something called testing parties. Testing parties, so you grab beers, you drink beers, and you also test the app. Uh, the beers are to make it more interesting because when you do it a few times, it can be a bit boring. But that's not the, the only thing we do. We also pay external people, so we like, there are companies that do that for you, and you send them your app, and they will test it for you, and we do that. Um, it's been very, if you pick the right companies, which means the expensive ones, um, it works pretty great. So another thing we do is, Dog food, and I shouldn't have put that word here because we've been uh, so Jack, our uh, CEO, told us we shouldn't use that word. So uh, instead, we should say you know internal releases. Why? Because it's a negative word. Dog food is like you know the food of the dog, uh, and but that's not what you want. You want you want it to be great. You want it to be like something you're proud of. Um, which, if you're building Twitter or Facebook, Uber, it's it's decently easy to do dog food, to test the app internally, right? But when you're building something like Square, where it's, it's, try, it's about selling stuff, like I don't sell, sell stuff every day, I don't get to ask, I mean, I can, maybe I can take your money afterwards if you want to give me money, but that's not kind of the point. Uh, so it's really hard to do dog food for us. So one of the things we do is we, we rely on more like on betas and on also to get insights from customers, we just go on site. This is uh, two colleagues working at Suvla, uh, which is a um, kind of a nice place in San Francisco, and they, they were there last week. Uh, it's, it's also great to get you know insights on how the app is performing. Um, so we prefer betas, but more importantly, for crashes, the thing that saves us on Android, and I'm, I'm hoping iOS is going to have these kind of tools anytime soon. But on Android is a stage rollout, uh, where you just um, say, I want to ship this new release to five or ten percent of. Uh, our users. Now, the whole point of this is to test the wire. You don't, you don't just release and say, well, we'll see. Instead, what you do is you release to a small percentage, and then you look at the crashes of that new release. And that means, it does mean that those poor 5% people are going to get all the new crashes, and, and potentially more crashes than normal users. And we're really sorry, but that allows us to fix the crashes for the other 90% and do like a Dutch release. Um, I think there's a, I think it's public, they announced it in some talk, but like Facebook that did, that did this kind of thing at a country level, they had like, uh, maybe in New Zealand they had a country where they would release all the new versions of their app that were kind of broken, uh, and I mean, I mean, sorry guys, but it's also really good for like testing, it's an interesting approach to that, um, different kind of notion of scale, but, so once we, when we, once we shift to 5 or 10 percent, um, we also need, you know, a feedback loop, so what we do is we build a tool, that extract the crashes and shows that you know to us. Now, what's kind of hard with crashes is you're gonna get raw number, like okay, the new version of the app got 100, 100 crashes. So if I tell you 100 crashes, is it good? Is it bad? How do we know? Uh, well, it depends on how many people have used it, right? So you kind of need to transform the crash number into crash rates. Um, but you also need to make it um, related to what you do as a business. So for us. We take payments. That's like kind of the core of Square Register. So we take the number of crashes and we divide it by the number of payments that transactions that were done on, on this version of the app, and that gives us a crash rate. And then we do a release. We look at the numbers. Uh, we try to fix the most important crashes, and then we do another release, etc., etc., etc. Well, so uh, that's that's about it. Um, so, kind of to remind you what, what I was talking about, there is the idea that obviously to fix the crash, 
you need to reproduce. You should never, ever look at a stack trace and say, oh, that's easy. I think it's that. I'll just do it and commit, and we'll see in the next release. Right? Try to repro. Um, then you need a whole lot of information if you want to be able to reproduce. And this, this, this should be more than enough to, to do that in most cases. Uh, and crash fast, which is kind of the title of this talk. And finally, once you crash fast, you really want to be careful, so state rollouts to prevent everybody from uh, not being able to use your app. Uh, my uh, cash tag, which is, uh, if you know Square Cash, a way, you know, Square Cash is a way to send money. So, um, it's a peer to peer payment uh, app. And I have a, I'm pretty proud, I don't know if I should be proud of that. Uh, that, that cash tag, but I was drinking beer at the time, so that might explain it. And that's my Twitter handle. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take uh, take them. One thing, though, I cannot talk about anything related to Square strategy. Only dev nerd stuff. I'm happy to do one last thing. Uh, I know I'm at Box, but Square is hiring. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How is Android versus iOS in terms of crashes for you guys? Um, I don't know the number, I wish I could say. So I know that uh, a year ago, iOS was much lower than Android. Um, and we started, I think it's around the same numbers now, it's around the same, uh, which is kind of unprecedented. iOS had a history of having a lower crash rate for us, and um, we're getting pretty good at this now. I, sorry, I don't have any like a defined, definite answer, I should have. More of a qualitative thing. Sorry? More of a qualitative thing, like what kind of errors crashes so, well, so I'm an Android developer, which means I, I actually don't really look into the iOS stuff. Um, so, uh, no, I really don't have any insights into what's, what are the sources of crashes on iOS. I mean, I know that on Android, it's simply, most, most of the time, it's just, you know, it's, it's always different, it's always complexity. Very often relating in some way to the Android lifecycle, and something happened where you're like, I thought I was here, but I wasn't here, I was there instead, and then things are weird. Which is why we put that search to say, I'm expecting to be here. And then we're like, oh, you weren't here because of that reason. And then we fix it. Yeah, so how do you get these reports back? Because if the user doesn't really press, is it really allowed to? Yeah, so, so yeah, that, that's a good question. So the idea of the, what, what happens uh, is, I mean, I could go back to the, one of the first slides, but it's basically uh, right before showing that dialogue, we hook into that. And then we upload that uh, to the web. I mean, in fact, Crashlytics or Bugsnag, which are libraries for crashes, do that for us. The way they do that in general is they take it, they serialize it to a file, and then they try to upload it. If the app, you know, if the process dies before that, they usually do it again on restart, and then they send it to the Crashlytics servers. And then so we do or Bugsnag again. Uh, and then what we do is we use their APIs to take all that and put that in our own uh, data centers. You don't have to do that, but we like to be able to like dig more in the data by exporting. Okay, like, it's some data from the user, right? So it's allowed. Like, it's some of the user's data plan. Um, that's a very good question. So sending a crash is consuming um, is using the user data. It's consuming the user data plan, right? Like they have a limited, a limited amount of data. And I agree, but we think it's more valuable that we fix these crashes. Um, than the cost for the user. Uh, we also try to be mindful of that sending, like, like I say, we're not sending bit maps, right? Um, what you could do if you're uh, really, like, maybe if you're Facebook, for example, what you could do and you have so many users is you could say, I'm only sending one in 10 crashes. You get a random distribution and then um, it should be okay. Like, you don't need all of the crashes because usually they get grouped and you just need to look at the most important ones. Any other question? Very good. Well, have a good night. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Uh, actually, talking about crash, I, I never received the five hundred and twenty-five dollar that uh, you were showing earlier in your presentation. Uh, I'll send you. I'll send you. I'll send you right away. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, happy to continue the conversation uh, with you guys. We uh, we still have uh, some uh, Mexican food, some beers, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs>